many thanks to the IMP and the BN Steel Award Committee and of course also to the organizers of today's event. It really is a, a huge privilege and also a great honor to have been selected for such a prestigious prize and um, so I'm really grateful for this, thank you. Um, so as you have heard already, I'm a developmental biologist by training because for me there's basically no question more fascinating than how can a single cell um, develop into such a complex organism. And uh, a crucial part of embryonic development is the proper organization of cell fates in both space and time. And in many cases um, such patterns as we can see them here are at least partially regulated by localized groups of cells that secrete um, signaling molecules that are known as morphogens. And uh, the special thing about morphogens is that they can give positional information to these surrounding cells. And they do this by forming uh, concentration gradients that can then be translated into spatial patterns. That works because basically the underlying cells, they can sense the morphogen and then depending on different morphogen concentration thresholds, they will start expressing different sets of target genes. And so you get these spatial patterns. So despite extensive studies, um, the mechanism of morphogen gradient formation has actually remained quite controversial, especially in epithelial tissues. So while passive diffusion would be like the simplest mode of morphogen transport, it has been questioned whether a diffusion-based mechanism can be actually uh, sufficiently reliable to do something as important as patterning a tissue. And as an alternative, active transport mechanisms have been suggested, such as specialized phylopodia that either deliver or pick up morphogens, or also planar transcytosis, where morphogens are transported through the cells rather than in the extracellular space. So in my PhD work, I wanted to address this long-standing question from a different perspective. And the basic idea was that if a diffusion-based mechanism is sufficient, then in principle um, any secreted protein should be able to form such a gradient and I decided that I would want to try to take a forward engineering approach to try to identify general principles and uh, constraints of gradient formation by transforming the green fluorescent protein GFP into a morphogen. And to do this in a developing tissue I used the patterning of the fly wing as a model system. The patterning of the fly ring happens in the larval stages of fly development in an epithelial tissue that is known as the wingy marginal disc. And in the wing disc, the BMP homolog DPP is expressed in this stripe of cells uh, and then disperses to each side and forms a gradient on, on either side of it. And because the target genes are expressed in a um, concentration dependent manner, uh, you get this nested target gene expression. And this is actually important because the high threshold target and the low threshold target together then position and specify these provane domains L2 and L5. And once the wing pouch, which is the circular area here, gives rise to the adult wing plate, these provane domains are refined into the longitudinal veins L2 and L5. And so it's a very nice patterning system. And the idea was basically to try to substitute DPP with GFP and then use the patterning of the ring as a readout to assess how well a diffusion-based GFP gradient can actually pattern uh, a developing organ. In this column, you can see normal wing development in a wild type. And here's just a schematic of uh, how the corresponding gradient would look like. While this is how it looks when you use a conditional allele to remove the DPP, so you don't have the gradient, and you can see that also, I mean, DPP is not only important for patterning, but also very much for the growth of the tissue. So you get this really tiny wing. So to be able to test if a GFP gradient can pattern the wing, I of course had to uh, engineer the DPP signaling pathway to be responsive to extracellular GFP. And to do this, I introduced two distinct anti-GFP nanobodies into the extracellular domains of the DPP receptors. And so in theory, now a GFP dimer should be able to tetmerize these receptors and activate downstream signaling. And importantly, when I expressed these uh, receptors alone, so in the absence of GFP, this did not have any effect on the mutant phenotype. So without GFP, they were not able to signal. 
So when I then, however, combined uh, these synthetic receptors with a conditional allele that expresses a GFP dimer instead of DPP, I was actually able to see a rescue of growth and patterning. However, um, if you look here at the, at the adult wing, it's really clear that patterning was not perfectly restored. And most prominently, you can see that L5 was much thicker than uh, in the wild type. And the reason for this was this wider domain of cells that was now competent to become L5 that basically resulted from a very short range domain of the high threshold target gene in combination with a much broader domain of the low threshold target gene. This can be explained by the fact that the GFP uh, is actually not confined to the wing disc epithelium, but can uh, diffuse uh, out of the tissue into the hemolymph, which is the larval blood. And so you can imagine that once you get high enough concentrations of GFP in the hemolymph, the GFP can actually also diffuse back into the tissue and basically activate the low threshold target gene throughout the entire tissue. And this clearly has very adverse effects on patterning. And so we were wondering, how can we actually um, improve the retention of GFP in the tissue, but at the same time also extend here the high threshold target gene to get something that looks more similar to the wild type. So natural morphogens, they do not only interact with the signaling receptors, but it's uh, known since very long time that they interact with many uh, other components uh, in the extracellular matrix. One of them are clipicans, which are heparin sulfate proteoglycans that are GPI anchored. So I wanted to try to actually kind of try to mimic such clipicans by engineering these so-called non-signaling receptors that have a low affinity uh, nanobody, so very similar to the low affinity binding interactions between clipicans and morphogens that really allow kind of transient interactions, not like the signaling receptors that are really strong uh, binders and also having a GPI anchor, just like the clipicans. And when I introduced this non-signaling receptor into this genotype, I actually got a much nicer rescue of the wing patterning. So we could see that now uh, we only get restricted uh, low threshold target gene domain, which basically means that we don't have any significant um, GFP signaling from the hemolymph. And at the same time, we also got this extension of the high threshold target gene. This was quite a striking result, but it was not really clear to us why do these non-signaling receptors have such positive effects on the patterning. A really nice thing about having such a forward engineering approach is, is that you really know all the components of the GFP morphogen system and also many of their properties. And so we decided to address this question with mathematical modeling. And to cut a long story short, our collaborators found that these GPI anchored non-signaling receptors most likely have diffusive properties. The underlying mechanism behind this could be the rapid lateral diffusion of GPI anchored proteins in the cell membrane and also their ability to um, transfer between neighboring cells. So basically you, having this uh, GPI mediated diffusivity was able to um, give us the simulations that really much uh, uh, fitted to our experimental results. To summarize, we were able to show that a diffusion-based GFP gradient can mimic the organizing activities uh, of a endogenous morphogen in the presence of signaling receptors. However, in an um, epithelial tissue like the wing disc, um, GFP leakage can occur and this can actually have adverse effects on patterning. However, we found that introducing uh, low affinity binding partners that are GPI anchored can actually restore the phenotype to something that is very close to the wild type. And our current working hypothesis that is based on simulations from our collaborators left us with the working hypothesis that it, we have a combination of free and NR facilitated diffusion uh, that makes uh, the GFP grading being able to, to pattern the fly ring. I mean, this still remains to be tested experimentally, of course. So finally, and most importantly, I want to thank the people that um, really made this work possible. So um, uh, first of all, my PhD supervisor, JP, who was really a great mentor and, and a lot of fun to work with, and also the entire um, Vincent lab for their support. Then, of course, uh, my fantastic collaborators, Guillaume Sabreu, Marc Dejeune, and Luca Cocconi. Unfortunately, I didn't show much of their work, but they have done a lot. 
the Fly Facility team, the Quick Fly community, and Maria Carmen for the beautiful artwork of the engineered fly, and of course uh, UCL and the Wellcome Trust for funding and the Francis Crick Institute. And you for listening. Thank you. Thank you.